They are working, I can tell. So if we can try and speak into these. We're going to have um, a final panel now, a discussion between um, some of the people who've been here today and some other people who are really important to our movement and to activism. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panellists to introduce themselves. Oh, for anybody who wasn't here earlier, because I've, I've just said to Dan, only half of the place will have heard your speech, only half of you will have heard mine. I'm Lisa Power, and I'm one of the organisers of this, this event for Pride, uh, for Pride Cunnery. I'm going to ask each of our panellists to introduce themselves. I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. Then we're going to throw it open to you. So if you would like to ask any questions, we're generally going to talk around the subject of does knowing our heritage as LGBT plus <coughs> people inform our activism? And should it? And has it? And how, how should we be doing about it in the future? Um, so I'd like to ask each of our panellists just to introduce themselves um, and say a little bit about themselves and heritage, what, what LGBT plus heritage and history means to them. So. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I'm Adam Price, I'm an OK man and I'm the, the leader of uh, Pike Henry, the uh, Welsh National Party. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, it's, it's memory is um, vitally important in, 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 in politics and in struggle for social justice. I, I think a lot about uh, that phrase by Martin Luther King, you know, that the, the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I, I hope he's right, but I'm not so sure, because you know, uh, we, we can have periods of progress, but then we have re reversal. And I think arming ourselves with understanding our own story is, is a means of, of defending uh, the advances that we have achieved, but, but also then, uh, engaging in, in struggles, particularly thinking about our, uh, the trans community that are, are ongoing very much in, in the present day. I also think particularly about understanding our own Welsh story as, as, as well, uh, because um, when was uh, homosexuality made illegal for the first time uh, in Wales? Uh, and and it, was, it was through the act of Indian. Um, and so actually understanding uh, our struggle here in Wales, you need to understand our national struggle. So the same acts of union that actually made the Welsh language um, uh, oppressed in Wales also oppressed the gay community. And to me that's, that, that contains a very, very powerful truth because actually fighting against one form of in, in oppression, then you need to realise that it's an universal struggle and because we we know that through discussion about intersectionality, but that's right at the heart uh, of our history in Wales. In 1542, uh, one of the Acts of Union banned uh, homosexuality for the first time in Wales, and it was part of actually the annexation of Wales into the, uh, the British Empire. Sure. Um, my name is Sean Fay, and I work for Stonewall Cymru, um, and I'm the Trans Engagement Officer there, so I work uh, my role is uh, to facilitate greater communication between the trans communities of Wales and, uh, and Stonewall Cymru. Um, and in addition to that, I'm a writer and uh, I've been a campaigner as well, specifically on trans issues for many years before that as well. In terms of <clears throat> what heritage and history mean to me, I think they're really vitally important because uh, it is a mechanism of oppression of LGBT people to deprive them of a sense of their own history. I think most those being gay, bi and trans people will have a memory it's a really fundamental early memory of that experience of feeling like you're the only one. The only one perhaps in your school, the only one in your class, the only one in your country, the only one ever. <laughs> that is a, a specific way in which people are isolated um, and oppressed. And so depriving people of their history is a fundamental way to increase that sense of isolation. So recovery and understanding our history is really vitally important to activism now because activism has to be collective and that's not just about the people around you now, it's understanding uh, where you are and, and why you exist as you do in this time. Like, these identities didn't just spring up uh, overnight, even the way that we, the labels we use, the way we understand ourselves have a historical context, so it's really important um, from that angle as well, I think. Um, my name is Joe Galliano. I'm the co-founder of uh, Queer Britain, so we're a campaign to, well, we're working very hard actually to launch a national LGBTQ plus museum, um, which will be about bringing in stories from around the country 
um, and really looking at sort of British history through the lens of uh, queer lives. And the, the thing that I think is, is really important, building on something Sean said here, which is that actually um, LGBTQ plus erasure it doesn't just affect LGBTQ people, um, it affects everybody. And that if we haven't, um, if we have a whole series of stories that have been hidden and under-told and under-recorded, actually it means that the whole country is missing out on a, a really enormously important slab of history. So without um, our stories being understood, the country can never understand itself. Um, and um, I think that's a, a, a huge sadness for everybody. I'm Dan, I do LGBTQ tours at the Victoria Art Museum in London, as well as the University of Cambridge Museums. And <coughs> I think sort of putting all that together, it is that idea of how things that we do, the history of the oppression of LGBTQ people, and the idea of intersectionality, where we all come together as well. That idea that what happens here have a rippling effect across the rest of the world as well. And it's something that you've got a very unique story and a very unique fight. Yeah, but I think what we do in order to address that can be applied elsewhere as well and uh, across the board that will help um, the rest of the world as well. I'm someone who um, was trained as a historian, it's my, my degree, um, and then went away from it for a very long time. And one of the reasons that I came back to it was that as uh, an LGBT activist, I got really irritated by watching other activists use the tiny bit that we knew of our history to further their own current agenda. So basically in the mid-90s I lost my temper with how people were portraying the Gay Liberation Front as whatever they wanted it to be. And I think a prime example of this is actually the way that uh, so many different people are said to have started the Stonewall Riot mm. and even when you agree on the person you don't agree on the definition of their gender or sexuality sometimes so uh, there seems to be a co-op I feel like there's been a big political co-option of our history uh, and that irritated me so I went away and I, I organised an oral history of the Gay Liberation Front so people could actually say for themselves who were there what the hell really went on which was of course a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting does it bother you? I mean, particularly you as a politician, you must see people changing history all the time to suit their current purposes. Is it important? Does it matter? Or is it more important that some tales get told, even if they're not entirely accurate? Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, I think that, um, we, in politics now, we talk a lot, a lot about narrative, mm -hmm. uh, public narrative, and uh, you know, the stories that we tell uh, about, our, about each other, about ourselves, they contain power because what they're trying to reproduce is some, some kind of uh, common understanding of who we are. So, yeah, I mean, th this, is, this is the terrain of, of how we define ourselves. And so, the, and the people that get left out, the absences, the erasures, you know, that, that tells us something very, very powerful indeed. And even within uh, LGBTQ uh, history, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, there are, there are, there, there's gendering going on, and you know, there, there are struggles within as, as well, um, and in terms of race and ethnicity, but also class. So, you know, Henry Paget, God bless him, uh, whatever he was, Viking to Marcus of Anglesey, well, let's, get, let's get the aristocratic nomenclature right. Um, Viking Tradiga, Evan Morgan from Newport, also, uh, you know, dabbled in the occult, you know, fantastically colourful characters, both. But what, what we tend to uh, not to get, actually, is the working class uh, history of LGBTQ people, you know, because, you know, they, uh, for, for reasons that are understood more generally in his history, that social history of um, working class you know, gay people isn't, it isn't uh, hasn't been told, isn't been, still being told, and I think that's one of the things that we need to focus on. Uh, rather, I mean, it's great to have um, colourful uh, uh, characters from the aristocracy, but does that really speak to us? Uh, and I think uh, some of the work that people like Dara Lecher and, and, and uh, is trying to do, uh, you know, the gay subculture within the mining community in the South Wales families, etc. I mean, you know, 
we were, we are, and we always have been universal. So I think some of the work that needs to be done is to actually recover some of those uh, lost stories. This is a very interesting uh, conversation I was having with the National Trust back here, where we were uh, talking about um, in a stately home, um, where the stories have always been about the lords and the ladies and the, the, the grand people who sort of lived upstairs. But actually the houses were inhabited by far more people downstairs, and, um, and actually far more people whose lives are relatable to our own lives and, and can really touch on our own lives. So that question, I think the, the, the sentence was, um, whose homes actually are these? Mm -hmm. um, I think that also comes down to whose voices are uh, whose, whose voices are, uh, who's given the space to talk. Um, I think that's very important to uh, monetize that. I sometimes wonder if, if there's an issue about people who are brought up to be confident about their right to, I mean, I have a lot of that history is for interfering with. Um, and I think some people, particularly from the upper classes or people who've been to university, stuff like that, are brought up with the, the assumption that we do have the right to interfere with history, whereas other people don't have that. How can we encourage everybody to see that anybody can interfere with history. I mean, Dan, the stuff you were talking about this morning, which some of the people in the audience will have heard, about actually using our existing museums to show people how anyone can get involved. I think in terms of that confidence, there, is, there has always been a voice of the museum, a single authoritative voice. That, that's no longer relevant anymore. What's relevant is social media is broken down. Social media has broken down that, uh, that idea of one to many. It's now one to one. We can have conversations with each other. Uh, in terms of just how activism, activism sort of plays in with the idea of history, for me, it's always one movement will feed into the next movement, will inspire the next movement. The things that work will go into the next. And if you think of the hotbed of one of the most remarkable periods of time, it was during when we had the, the civil rights revolution at the same time as the anti-war movement, at the same time as the gay rights movement, all these things were just feeding into each other in a rather remarkable way. And together, all those movements together had a huge effect. And it is that because so many voices were feeding into one <coughs> pot. And I think that we also have to remember, as you said, revolutions, they are circular by nature, and so if we don't hold on to every single thing that we gain, we will start to fall backwards, you know, we will start to we'll take a step forward, but we'll take two steps back. And we are seeing that we are losing so many things across the world. At the same time, we're gaining a lot of things as well, but we just got to hold on to every single one of those things. And I think that idea that we have an ability to get our voices heard and build a momentum on a, on a level that is unprecedented in history. I remember there was the, uh, the V&A's uh, um, uh, exhibition about um, protest. Um, if you kind of just look at a map of protest over time, it sort of starts off small, but this in this period, it's like there is just constant protest and there's constant uh, uh, fights being put forward. And just get involved is, is what I can say. You, you're, you've got so much power now than any other period in time. And if you just get your voice heard, that's that's key. I think quite often people think of history as something last century, way back, you know, 19th century and previously. Um, and I think that's quite difficult for LGBT communities because the further back we go, the, the hazier a lot of that is. But I have actually found it much easier. When we're putting together the Icons and Allies exhibition, which is upstairs, if anybody hasn't seen it yet, pop up at the end and have a quick look. Um, I found it much easier in the 21st century to talk about people from the past, because if I'd done it in the 1980s, we'd have had to call everybody lesbian or gay. They would have absolutely had to have you know, that kind of label, and we would back-label people uh, in history terms quite often. That's much less common now, apart from, I do see, and I think this is about who are, who are the most oppressed people in a group, 
uh, who still need to grab their history. I see a certain amount of calling people tramps when we actually don't know where they came down on various lines. But I think that that is more about the fact that we do need to get better trans, I mean, I'll come to you in a minute about this, but I, I feel that we need to get better and more historical role models around uh, trans people. But uh, the recent history is also important. And one of the things that has really surprised me is all those of us who lived through Section 28 in the 80s, watching what's come around in the last five years around trans issues and the fact that it's identical tactics. Uh, it's a whole load of things um, that are being taken in the same way, getting, um, uh, having a go about kids and how we're, we're going to ruin kids, um, having a go at people trying to split off the nice trans from the activist trans and all of those things. And because we can see it, I wonder how much difference that makes to our ability to fight back on it. I mean, it, it certainly informs a lot of the LGB people that I know who are concerned about it, but I wonder whether it's actually a commonly held view or whether it, I mean, for you it must feel like just the same shit it felt like for us back in the 80s. Yeah, well, I have, I, on a personal level, I have a strange experience because I initially, my teens come out as gay and Section 28 was still in force when I was at school. <laughs> I can sort of remember the end of one wave and, and then transitioned and entered a new wave. Um, I think just to go back to what you were saying about uh, the revision of history and how frustrating that is, I think one of the things that's happening with the current anti-trans wave, which is very frustrating and kind of why I'm, I'm interested in history as well, is that the, there's obviously the uh, one of the many tactics used against trans people is to separate us off from LGB. Um, which is a very effective tactic because it stops us as a, as a minority within a minority of having kind of collective resistance. And obviously people manipulate history in order to do that. Um, and, and, and that's a very effective tactic. But I think the um, way in which people do that is that there is a general fear of, like you say, haze. Um, is that actually when you look back uh, even to the Stonewall riots, which as you say now that there is, for example, the Stonewall riots, a very clear <coughs> narrative online about that it was led by trans people and actually it's a bit it's a bit more complicated than that it's very unclear what the identities of the people like Marsha P Johnson or Sylvia Rivera what their identities were by modern categories it's, it's much more blurred they were drag queens they would refer to themselves as gay they obviously exhibited gender non-conformity it doesn't fit into modern categories we've got very clear categories that have evolved over time now and people like to uh, really bolster the boundaries of those categories but actually a lot of people lived in between them ambiguously but one of the reasons that people um, I think cling to like who started the Stonewall riots as you say is because um, it, yeah it's about uh, a fear of actually admitting we don't really know more than you know 20 30 40 years ago who, who was a gay man who was a trans woman who was a lesbian who was a trans man who was non-binary by our own understandings the reason why we're all LGBT is because that has always been ambiguous and because the majority of society has always treated us as basically the same, we might argue over the individual delineations between us, but actually most people and bigots don't care. Um, and it's depressing in some ways in this current way to see sometimes people who are LGB and cisgender, who are bigoted against trans people, to forget that and, um, and to partake in this kind of uh, nonsensical separation of of transgender people as being somehow separate or a modern phenomenon um, when that's clearly not the case. Because things are moving so fast around uh, identity and definitions, I mean, even within today we've talked about LGBT, LGBT+, LGBTQ, um, and when I do um, my talk about Stonewall, I have to remember that I'm saying lesbian and gay about the 80s, um, and LGBT now, and if I happen to go back past the 80s, back into the 70s, I start just saying gay, because I've been through all those language transitions. And recently there was quite a big row about a plaque to Anne Lister, yeah. um, which just called her gender non-conforming. Um, and there were lots of rows about whether it should have said lesbian or woman-loving or a multitude of other things. How do you, do you think that we're making interesting difficulties for the heritage industry? I mean, Dan or, or Joe, what do you think? 
after you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, how are you going to handle that with the, the museum? Well, I mean, that's, I mean that's, that's a very interesting and very complicated question. You and, um, kill me later. Well, maybe, yeah, <laughs> I'll talk about this later. Um, and one, one that I don't have a simple, a simple answer for, but it's also, as somebody who's standing here as a sort of white, cisgendered, uh, gay man, um, I, I don't necessarily feel that it's actually for me to come up with that answer. I think it's, uh, it's to pass it back to the people whose stories are telling. We, we wouldn't want to give a platform to tell. And then let them tell us how they want to be uh, talked about, as far as possible. That's harder when you look back at this. <laughs> yeah, you so. can't really dig analysts her up and ask her. That's no, the trouble. Yeah. But it, it is, people are almost trying too hard to be correct. Mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, I don't mind people not getting it right the first time. If only they'll, you know, if they are interested in debating and listening and thinking about what might be a better way of doing it. Mm -hmm. It just feels like some people are making decisions on our behalf about what our definitions ought to be. And that also that comes back to the um, to, I think to the main point as well about uh, who has told our stories and you know, to the um, who has always told the uh, outcome of, of uh, wars, for example. And it's always been about uh, the victor, the victor uh, telling the story of the um, community or the country being defeated and um, slandering them and position in, in ways that make them seem. Uh, Weak or uh, stigmatising in other ways. I think that's, that's, that's a similar kind of function. I find it particularly fascinating here that we, we do have some narratives around LGBT history, but when we did the Icons and Allies exhibition here, we had pretty much equal amounts of I didn't know they were gay or lesbian or bi or trans, and I didn't know they were Welsh. <laughs> so we, we've erased quite a lot of Welshness, I feel, as well as a lot of uh, LGBT. I don't know how you feel about that, Adam. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I think that has to be, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a principal focus for here, here, here in Wales. I mean, the, the purpose is to recover, um, you know, submerged stories. Then it's it's the, it's it's those Welsh stories that are being submerged more and more. So I'm thinking, you know. There are, uh, listening to Jeffrey earlier talking about the, the, the Ronda, you know, um, uh, the Ronda writer, Rhys Davis, you know, um, uh, talks obliquely really about his sexuality in, in his work, but it is there. Uh, but then, then, you know, you've got Emily Williams, I mean, uh, the, the great Welsh uh, Hollywood successful actor, completely self-confident about his bisexuality in the 1930s, in his biographies published before legalization. Uh, um, and yet, you know, who knows about him? I'm quite as green. People, you know, when I was in school, we still studied it in, 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 in school as part of the curriculum, but uh, his bisexuality uh, less so. But um, so I, 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 I think finding those, finding those stories and, 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 and people in history that speak to both those identities, our LGBT identity and, you know, the Welsh identity, and fuse them, you know, because that's growing up, that was the challenge that I faced, that I, I felt I had to choose, you know, being, being Welsh and being gay, you know, ridiculous. But that's how it was, it was presented in, 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 in many ways, that these were, these were two, and in so many other cultures, the, the same thing you know, has been true. And part of our job is to show, well, that's obviously, that's a completely ridiculous and oppressive myth. Um, here are all the stories to prove that we've always been here. You know, it's that sense of, um, in order to build um, esteem and uh, self-esteem on confidence um, in individuals growing up. But if you if you remove any images of um, who they are uh, from the, the public space, um, it becomes almost impossible to develop that in a healthy, um, wholesome, wholesome way. Whether that's Welsh, whether that's a gay identity, whether that's um, trans person or uh, women uh, or, or gay men um, and uh, that it, it's such a good way of keeping people down and also if you take away uh, those freedoms for people to see themselves reflected in the society it is everybody that suffers because the society is weaker for it because the society lacks confidence 
So you see, it, it gives a proposal. I mean, I think it, it's true that it, uh, it's true that we still don't teach Welsh history uh, here in Wales very effectively. I mean, uh, all kinds of well understood um, uh, sort of uh, colonialist reasons for that. But uh, I, I, as well as teaching our own history in general, I think uh, in the curriculum we should have uh, a responsibility to, to teach Welsh LGBTQ history to to all young people. Because it's you know it's part of everyone's heritage actually the, the rich diversity of Welsh culture, including on LGBT uh, um, culture, is, is something we've got to learn. So let's get it in the, in the Welsh national curriculum. Well, there was a suggestion earlier on. Thanks to Dan's talk about the um, the tours he's been doing at the VNA and so on. Um, a friend of mine called Bob has been talking to him about whether we should try and have that kind of a tour through the National Museum of Wales. I mean, would, you, would you like to see that? If we maybe talked about getting that together for next year? <laughs> I'm talking myself into doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, would you give us a hand if you want to do that? I, I would, I would give us some advice. I, I just, for the record, just because it's not facing you, I, I saw a lot of people going, yes. <laughs> so, um, Great job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, I think the key thing is, though, just to keep that question mark open. Um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure of the specifics of the end list of just to go back to that, but it is completely fine to put a question mark on it because the further you go back, the terminology is blurred even, even, even more, and, and it is perfectly fine to just ask the question. And I think, um, you know, what does it mean to be Welsh? What does it mean to be LGBTQ, for example? What does it mean historically? That, that always changes and it, it's constantly evolving. And so it is lovely for us to have these icons and heroes. Uh, and it is lovely to have this rich history. Um, but it is also completely fine, I think, to uh, review the way that we we'll read into that as well. Well, the court was according to Gerald de Wales, and he's put in mind of this in watching this fantastic uh, presentation on the, uh, the city of the According to General the Wales, the Welsh invented homosexuality because they were, we were originally Trojans, of course, and it was Brutus that came. So it's part of, you know, it, it, uh, it's part of our heritage in more ways than more than the Welsh. Well done to the Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's our most successful export. <laughs> Better even than corn. I think we also need to challenge um, people because what often happens is that in a search for respectability, bits of us get erased and the classic example of that is recently, I, I, most of you probably know there was um, a competition for the first statue of a real woman, historical figure of a woman in Wales to be um, put in the square outside Cardiff, Cardiff Central Station. <coughs> there were five candidates in the final and of those five candidates, two of them were quite definitely big old dykes <laughs> and nobody said it at any point during the competition. Well, we were yelling it from on Twitter and social media, but it was completely erased that Cranogwen certainly had same-sex relationships, um, and and you know we we don't know what the definition was, where whether maybe um, she was one thing or another, but we know that she had those relationships. And Viscountess Rhonda was a flaming dyke who lived with a series of women over the years. Um, but what's interesting with Viscountess Rhonda, they didn't just erase her lesbianism. They also, because it looked inconvenient, erased her fascism from the 1930s because she started out as a brick-throwing suffragette, but she ended up a right fascist in the 1930s. <laughs> and nobody talks about that because we've got to be nice about people and being nice to people, not, telling, not saying when they're fascists, but also not saying when they're non-gender conforming, lesbian, bi, trans, whatever. Yeah, and I feel, I, to return to the Anne Lister example, I think just to explain for those who don't know, I think the reason the conflict existed over her description there was again, it was about a modern division being transplanted back onto the past. So she was someone that had, you know, a woman who loved women, let's describe it that way. And she was described in the pack as gender not conforming. And the reason there was some anger about that was because of this anxiety that, for better or worse, currently exists. Um, about a perceived antagonism between trans people and cisgender lesbians, the idea that trans people are somehow erasing lesbianism. And 
uh, this idea that she, uh, someone that would have previously just been labelled a lesbian, was now being called gender non-conforming, was that there was this fear. And I think it is worth having a conversation and unpacking that. But it's a really difficult conversation to have. But, you know, some of my thoughts about that would be that actually lesbian erasure is very real. It's something that is ongoing within society, within the LGBT community too. Um, often by men, often by gay men. And, and where is, you know, that there is a legitimate source of anger there about whether or not lesbians are being represented when people point out the LGBT media doesn't even really mention lesbians. That's real, but it's interesting that the target then becomes another group that's often erased, trans people. And this infighting um, over a plaque is actually representative of something much bigger uh, and not so easily resolved as what analysts are identified as. Something, sorry, to go home. So, about ten, until about ten years ago, I was the editor of Gay Times magazine, and um, it historically had largely built up a, a male following. And um, when I had the, the temerity to put Lily Allen on the cover, um, it caused absolute horror within the leadership of the organisation that, that somehow it's like. Gay men weren't going to be interested. I mean, here he is, for God's sake. Gay men weren't going to be interested in um, women on the cover. This was a, 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 a magazine for men, and I was, and I think it was probably one of the loudest rounds I remember I ever had when I was when I was there for this very very point. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to throw it out to the audience. Is anyone up? Oh, questions? <laughs> um, I want to ask a question about the kind of second half of the discussion, um, should it? I mean, I'm sure my experience growing up is not unique in this room. I grew up as a bi man in kind of rural North Cumbria, working class, and it was absolutely awful. <laughs> um, but that made me political, and it made me um, an LGBT activist. And I think as we, as, as society is progressing and it's being more um, acceptable to come out and be proud of who we are, um, a lot of people are maybe losing touch with our heritage and being less political, being less active in the community. And um, do you think that's the okay? case? And secondly, also, I kind of feel like that's a sad thing, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe actually it's a good thing that people don't have to be an activist and don't have to be political to be queer. Um, I was just going to, uh, it just made me think, so I'm going to say it before I forget, is that actually I think one of the most interesting points about that is, which is quite sad, is that I think there's a lot, one of the problems about LGBT history is the fact that there, it's not encouraged in LGBT communities often enough. So there to be kind of intergenerational uh, communication between LGBT people of different generations. So I remember I was like 26 before I ever really spoke, you know, and I'd, I'd been out as LGBT since I was a teenager really had friendship with anyone who, like the gay men who were older. And actually the first time I had a conversation with an older gay activist whose boyfriend had died in the AIDS crisis, or all his friends had died, his family disowned him, to fully contemplate actually the experience of someone who was only like, you know, was younger than my mother. Um, the different political experience which he had had of being gay to what my friends had had, to fully contemplate that I'd never had a space to do that because I'd come out and gone to like the student LGBT society and got drunk. Like there was just, you know, and I think I think one of the, the biggest ways to improve community activism is to is to think about how we create real spaces for people to kind of uh, interact with each other and learn from each other across generations. When I when I was on Gay Times on the 40th anniversary of the partial decriminalisation of, um, of uh, gay sex, um, I was concerned about this exact. Question. We, we brought together a, a, a round table of um, four young men who had been born in 1967 and four who were already adults in 1967. Just to <coughs> see what they knew about it. Bugger of them. I mean, there was, there was a huge kind of like gap between them. Two of the young, youngsters hadn't actually even known that it had been illegal for them to um, love whoever they, they were going to love. The older, the, the way we framed it was that you know, the older um, participants were uh, shocked and horrified and it's like they were slapped around the face um, because they'd lived on the barricades and they'd been pushing, pushing for these changes. But the, the way that we, the way that we, uh, we framed it, we, we thought about it was, first of all, um, thank you for the amazing work you did that these um, young people 
can just get on with their lives. They have that luxury of not having to live on the barricades and make the sacrifices that you have to make. Um, but where are they going to, where, if they don't know what they don't know, are they going to find out about this when we're not hearing consistently, we weren't hearing consistently in schools about our heritage, we weren't hearing consistently in the popular culture, we weren't hearing consistently in our families and our friends groups. So, so I, I think, you know, your, your point is, is a crucial one, really, because, I mean, I, you know, I, uh, growing up in, in the 80s as a gay man, you know, you, you, you had no choice but to be political, you know, when the, the act of just, you know, holding hands is, is you know, was, a rad, was an act of radicalism, in the same way that for the Welsh language movement here in Wales, yeah, just speaking uh, your own language was an act of, you know, a, pol a political protest, yeah. And now, as we move towards equality, uh, greater equality in both those spheres, yes, you know there is there is a sense of you know our people are being radicalised, you know, because we can just we can just live our lives now. We don't have to worry about politics. And there's a trap there, I, I, I think. And you know this this is all. Uh, and the way that we tell our LGBT history, I think, is 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 important because if we just tell it as this sort of Uni Olivia march to progress, you know, and yeah, we achieved equality and it's all done now. No, well, we're falling into that trap. Where it's actually within our own history, you know, we, we heard about James Baldwin. Uh, uh, there are other people um, uh, like him, uh, Bayard Rustin, yeah, who was a gay man, a member of the Communist Party, kind of uh, a Quaker poet, extremely radical, uh, was one of the key, key people in the Black Civil Rights Movement, right? So within our own history, there have always been a tradition or, or people that have said, look, we're not just about site-specific struggle, you know, once we win a gay equality, we're done. You know, we are, because we've, we've lived on the margins of society, we understand there needs to be an universal, radical transformational project that changes, you know, uh, life for all of humanity, right? And if we lose sight of that just because you know, we can join the military, the church, and any other of the most conservative traditional organizations we can, you know, is that what we fought for? So let's hold on to that truth in our history, which is to say, we are about the universal uh, emancipation of all of humanity. Because otherwise, what was the point? part-trained academic, I would say this with my, but um, part of it is about having the facilities to research these stories and research these histories. And, you know, this event and other events are doing it. Um, there's some writing taking place and some research taking place. But I just wonder whether somehow uh, spaces need to be created, organisations need to support you know, the research of and writing into history at all the levels that the panel are talking about, nothing's excluded. Um, because, you know, the you know the battle continues, doesn't it? But I, I think we do need maybe connections, maybe events that actually write these histories and tell these histories, I think. I think that's a, uh, we can't leave it largely to individuals, which is where I think it's taking place at the moment, or is that unfair? I'm not sure. And hopefully, that's what you're going to be doing, Joe. That's exactly, exactly what we're working to. I mean, so, the work that I say Dan is doing is, is wonderful. Out in the uh, broader cultural space, <coughs> but actually, we need our own space that we can tell our own stories and we own the own stories. So, that's exactly what we're doing. Has anybody got any last remarks that they'd like to make? Nope. Um, I would always say beware of people who, um, it's always useful to investigate as well when more and more people, it's easier for people to be pro LGBT in institutions and organisations. I think it's always important to be mindful of how people were in times where it was less easy uh, and, what, and what they're currently masking. So for any, one of the things I find fascinating is, uh, for example, LGBT asylum seekers and refugees and how they might be treated um, in the UK politically at the moment. And actually, how that's very tied to how all LGBT people were treated even like 30 years ago. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank our panel. Um,
who'd been here, and actually quite a lot of inspiring things got said in that session, I think. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all of our speakers who've been here today. Um, thank you to all of you for being here. Pride Cymru uh, does something every year for History Month. Uh, we do it on a shoestring. Uh, a lot of volunteers are involved, so I'd like to thank them. If you would like to find out more about Pride and getting involved maybe as a volunteer during the year, you can talk to Adam or Kath or Jan, who are, Jack, Kath and Jan are at the back there. Um, so there's plenty uh, to be going on with. If you have any thoughts about today, please put them on your evaluation forms. We would really be grateful if you filled in evaluation forms, even if you've only heard one or two of the talks, um, because that helps us when we try and go and chisel some money out of somebody next year. <laughs> I would like, like to say that if you missed any talks or you think you missed a bit of a talk or didn't quite get it, all of the talks will be up on the Pride, there will be links to them on the Pride Cymru website as soon as possible, i.e. not tomorrow, within the next few weeks. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you.